Welcome, or welcome back as the case may be, to the sixth and final presentation of design proposals for the Anthony Timberland Center for Design and Materials Innovation. To uh, keep it interesting, I'm going to reverse the order of my comments from previous moments. Six architecture firms from around the world were selected as finalists for a design competition to envision the future Anthony Timberland Center for Design and Materials Innovation at the University of Arkansas. This center is planned as an important extension of the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design and as a key part of the university's Wingate Art and Design District, a campus district along Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard that also houses existing and proposed buildings for the School of Art and University Libraries. This new applied research center will serve as, as the epicenter for the Faye Jones School's multiple timber and wood design initiatives, house the school's existing and expanding design build program and fabrication technologies laboratories, and serve as the new home to the school's emerging graduate program in timber and wood design. The six finalists, culled from 69 submissions from 10 countries, were selected based on the design excellence of the individual architect or practice at the national and even international level, as well as demonstrated achievements in innovation with materials and construction. All six finalists are accomplished in both professional practice and architecture education. The design competition, these presentations, uh, the exhibition, uh, is all, in fact, funded by a grant from the U.S. Forest Service and the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities. This uh, building, as envisioned, could not be envisioned in this way were it not for, in the first place, the generous philanthropy of the Anthony Timberlands Company, and in particular, John Ed and Isabel Anthony, a, a philanthropy matched by uh, funding from the university and then expanded by additional funding for equipment from Governor Hutchinson in Little Rock. We are very grateful to the Chancellor, Chancellor Steinmetz, Provost Provost Coleman, to Mike Johnson and the entire team at Facilities Management of the University for their support of this effort. But you know, this effort, uh, in fact, began in August of 2016 with a symposium here in Fayetteville, a seminar in Little Rock, all to indicate uh, to both the academic community as well as the industry and investment community that there was much potential yet to be explored in the forest economy of the state of Arkansas. And uh, we now stand, I would assert, as a school and as a university at, again, the epicenter of the region and potentially of the nation in these particular regards. Certainly, the two constructions here on this campus, the Library Annex Building, completed in 2018, and the uh, Adohi Residence Halls, just opened in August of 2019, uh, signal that leadership role. The Anthony Timberland Center for Design and Materials uh, innovation represents yet another step forward in asserting that role. And we look forward now to hearing from, again, the sixth finalist in our uh, competition range, Lever Architecture. Lever Architecture is a Portland-based architectural design practice founded in 2009 by Principal Thomas Robinson. The firm's work explores making, materiality, and experience challenging conventional methods of fabrication and using local and commonplace materials in unexpected ways. In this spirit, Lever Architecture has emerged as a leading practice in the innovation and implementation of mass timber in North America, pursuing architecture that benefits the environment and regional economy alike. With a diverse uh, portfolio, which includes institutional, cultural, residential, and creative office buildings, Lever Architecture demonstrates precision and elegant detailing in a range of projects. Selected works include Langalo Estate Winery in Newburgh, Oregon in 2016, the Adidas North American Headquarters in Portland, underway but anticipated yet this year, 
and Red Fox Commons in Portland completed in 2019. Lever has been recognized with numerous awards, including the U.S. Tall Building Prize and AIA Design Excellence Awards. Lever was also named to Architectural Records Design Vanguard and the Architectural League of New York's Emerging Voices in 2017. Thomas Robinson is here with his team, and I will uh, welcome Thomas, the team of Lever Architecture, to the podium and to our school. The floor is yours. So thank you, Peter. It's really an honor to be here and be part of this competition um, for the Anthony Timberlands Design and Materials Innovation Center. Um, I also want to thank you for coming to the final presentation. I'm sure you've seen a lot of these, so it's great that you're sticking it out. Appreciate it. Um, your, your vision for this project is bold, uh, and it's inspired our team to create a, a proposal that is beautiful and also what I would call outrageously pragmatic, because we want to see that thing, we want to see this happen. Um, it's very much rooted in Arkansas, and ad but addresses global issues that we all must collectively face relative to rural economic equity and climate change. It's an opportunity to demonstrate that poetics and pragmatism can be two sides of the same coin when we consider where mater materials come from how they're made as drivers of design. Before I go further, I wanted to introduce our team. Um, Shonda Robinson, who you can see right in the front of me here on the left, would be the project director. Um, she recently completed a 156,000 square foot uh, state-of-the-art CLT and glue land building in Portland. Um, she's under construction on uh, one of the first, uh, or the first mass plywood office building um, in the United States. Mass plywood is a new product coming out of uh, Oregon area for a major foundation. And um, Chandra's also a commissioner on the uh, Portland Design Commission. So I like to say if there are any architects who are gonna be working in Portland, they, they should get to know and be very nice to Chandra. <laughs> Um, she's also just a really great person to work with. We really just, uh, and can bring many, many diverse groups together and, and, and really focuses on um, the community in Portland. Uh, Susanna Drake, founder of D-Land Studio, is her landscape um, partner. Susanna is globally known for her work on, I'd say, performance-based designs. Um, a lot of the work that she's done relative to stormwater surges in Manhattan relative to climate change. I would really recommend you take a look at that. Um, she, I've known Susanna now for 15 years, which is always surprising when you think about that professionally. Uh, and it's really an incredible opportunity to work with her. And she has recently completed a project in North Little Rock um, called Argento Plaza that you should take a look at. I think they're just finishing construction. She's passionate about you know, landscape and community. Uh, and you know, I'm, we're also, very excited to have her on our team because we think landscape is a critical part of this project. This is the uh, competition team from Lever. They're actually in uh, Stefan Schneider's shop. It's the shop uh, of Cut My Timber. Cut My Timber is a fabrication um, shop that we work with um, frequently. If you've had a chance to see our installation in the exhibit space, which I actually haven't been in, there's a large mock-up that was actually cut by the CNC machines in this, machi in, in this space. I'm gonna introduce a couple other people in our team that aren't here. Uh, there's Eric McDonald from Holmes Structures. Eric and I have worked together for many years, and he's really been involved with pretty much every mass timber project that we've done. Um, there's Bevan Jones from Holmes Fire. Uh, Bevan is working on some of the most complex fire-related uh, engineering issues um, in the United States. And then we're also working with uh, Thomas Auer from Trans Solar Climate Engineering, and what he's really doing is, the, is uh, really helping us integrate sustainability into the kind of core of the design. 
Um, and then our local team, Polk Stanley Wilcox, has been helping us understand the local lay of the land, and uh, it's been a great to kind of collaborate with this entire greater team. So, uh, over the last three years, I'm going to go back because I don't want to do that. I did that in the presentation today, too, so it's sort of funny. <laughs> Um, over the last three years, I've had the opportunity to spend time in Arkansas and Fayetteville, and that, that conference that Peter talked about was actually the first time I'd ever been to Arkansas. And I was here, and I, re I remember my first visit so clearly, I was probably here for 20 hours, I got a call, and it said, why don't you come speak at this office, you know, this conference on mass timber. So I arrived, and I was truly blown away by this place, by this school which was the nicest architecture school I had ever spent time in anywhere. Uh, and also by just the, you know, the landscape and by seeing projects like Thorn Crown, seeing projects like Crystal Bridges uh, in such a sort of short and intense period and also by the commitment of the people here to thinking about changing the way we think about design. And what, you know, since then I had the opportunity to teach uh, with a studio that was actually funded by the USDA, a truly talented group of students. And this is a picture of that group in Portland in the snow, which it does not snow very often in Portland, but they, they happen to bring the snow out to the Northwest, I guess. Uh, but, you know, it really changed the way I think about uh, our practice and design. Um, people coming from incredible, diverse uh, variety of backgrounds and, and really inspiring. And I, I, I believe I learned as much as I hope I imparted in that experience. And then lastly, more recently, we were involved with the Timber Design Symposia here, organized the school that was equally inspiring. Um, and now I'm actually good friends with an architect out of New Zealand who's doing really innovative timber work. This never would have happened had I not had an association with the University of Arkansas and the Fay School. So, you know, in a, in a funny way, I feel I've connected more widely with the world here than I actually have in Portland. So, one thing I've learned in my time here is that I believe you have everything you need right now today in Arkansas um, to create a world-class design and innovation center. You have an, an incredible landscape and forest resources. You have a rich local tradition of pragmatic wood buildings connected to that landscape. You have a significant architectural legacy connected to this place and to this school. There is a vibrant contemporary architectural community, practices working right here in the region that connect both to that legacy that I talked about earlier, but they reinvent it. And you know, one of your own has been recognized with the AIA gold medal, which is an incredible honor. Um, and you have people that are really committed, faculty that are dedicated, students that are smart, students that are motivated to change the way we think about design and architecture today. You have a university that is, as Peter noted, um, visionary in their commitment to mass timber. And they are changing the conversation in mass timber in this region with what you're seeing happening with Walmart and it's being recognized outside. No one in the world is doing what is happening here in Arkansas right now with Mass Timber. Could you stay up? Because we're yeah. Gonna, yeah. We'll ease the transition. Um, so, so I have to say my first exposure to, uh, to Arkansas was a collaboration with Marlon Blackwell. We did this competition for Portal to Point back in 2011, um, and actually Jonathan um, Balkins was also on the, the team uh, at the time. And, um, and it was just an incredible experience working with Marlon, and he brought me, then subsequently brought me back to the school, and I gave a lecture. And after the lecture, this really incredible student came up and said, I really like your work, and I'd really like to work with you. And, and, and then I talked to Marlon, he said, oh yeah, he's really talented. And I looked at his work, and said, oh yeah, he's really talented. And um, this guy, Nick Jabs, came and worked with me and did some really important work for my studio. Um, this was the Under the Elevated project, looking at the 666 miles of of under the elevated space in New York City. Um, Nick has gone on to do great things. He went off to Penn for grad school, and now he's working at Port Urbanism, um, you know, leading more great projects. Uh, and I think 
it was Peter that brought me back for the Mayor's Institute on um, city design, and I met a lot of mayors from all over Arkansas. And, um, and one of those mayors, Joe Smith uh, from North Little Rock, he, he liked our work, and he liked to think of North Little Rock as being kind of the Brooklyn of Little Rock. And I'm from Brooklyn, so I was like, oh, yeah, that works. Um, so we ended up designing this plaza in collaboration with Taggart Architects down in, in North Little Rock. And, um, and it's just been an incredible collaboration. And actually, by the way, the lighting design was done by um, Richard Renfro, who is also a graduate of, um, of uh, University of Arkansas. So we've had this incredible collaboration with people from Arkansas. And we are really just inspired by that and by the landscape and by the ability to just get incredible work done, incredible design work done in really compelling ways. So. Thank you, Susanna. You've challenged us to create a design that embodies innovation with an economy of means is functional, but also inspires, um, supports the work of students and faculty, but makes that innovative work visible to the wider community. For us, at a fundamental level, this project is about making, and how we take what we have at hand to make something exceptional. Over the last three years, Lever has led six award-winning timber projects, all made with material from where we live in Oregon. Many of these projects are the first of their type in the United States and in the world. Our emphasis on making um, and materials led us to initially consider um, how to sort of design the space that we see as sort of central to your building, the fabrication shop. And also thinking uh, more deeply about where is making occurring in architecture schools today? And if you think, you ask yourself, where is the shop in most design schools today? It's in the basement. Uh, and that obviously has been solved with your program and the vision for this project. It's really taking that out of the basement but when you think of a fabrication shop, it's not so much a space that inspires. But when I think of a fabrication hall, that to me is interesting. That to me is a space that I, that I can think of. And one of the first spaces that came to mind when we sort of had this epiphany of the hall as opposed to the shop was Peter Barron's Turbine Hall in Berlin. And I actually, weirdly, in 1995 lived two blocks from here in Berlin. <laughs> and every day I would sort of walk by hoping to see the doors open. And one day I came by and you could actually, they'd kind of open the door slightly and I peeked in and they were still building turbines in there. And they're still using this space. And I actually just learned on the internet recently that you can rent it out for weddings. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a testament that of the power of a space that you can actually um, over a hundred years later, it's this hall that sort of sticks in your collective memory. And that for us, you know, was, was something that was important. So if you start with this idea of a fabrication hall that inspires, then you need to think about, well, how do you activate that space to create what you're creating, which is innovation center. And we've done a lot of work with the Walt Disney Company and Pixar thinking about um, how you take program and you arrange it around a central space to drive informal interaction. So that informal interaction, it's like I see somebody across the room and I'm like, oh wow, I had this idea and you're the person that could maybe help me solve it. That's how innovation happens. And if you talk to the leadership at Pixar, that's what makes great work. So we thought, well, let's take the program that you have, the auditorium, the labs, and let's arrange it around that hall to activate that space. Then we thought, well, how could we make that a little bit more intense? Um, and the reality is, is the work is happening at the ground level, so if we could actually shape the space, we could have it so that the spaces were up high, had a better view of the, the, the fabrication hall floor, and there's more intensity in terms of that action. Um, we also 
thought it was incredibly important that the fabrication hall isn't just walled off from the landscape. So, you know, you can imagine a big hall that runs one from um, end to end, and you have this sort of solid program. We said, you know, it's really important that that space actually connects to the district, connects to the art school, connects to the wider campus community. And we thought, how could we also, you know, amplify that connection? And what brings people together in architecture school and design school? And the thing that came to mind is coffee. So we added a cafe to your program, because we think, <laughs> we think that, and it's funny, I, you know, I've worked on a lot of creative campuses for Pixar and um, Adidas and Walt Disney, and the thing we talk about the most is where we put the coffee, <laughs> and where's the kitchen, and how people are going to get there, and how that's going to activate the space. It's actually a pretty serious deal, a pretty serious conversation, and we think by putting the cafe at the intersection between the fabrication hall and the landscape, we can drive, um, uh, in a way, interaction, and that will drive innovation. And also, this is a relatively large quad, and there's not, not as far as I know, there isn't really that type of space. So it's not just going to serve um, the design schools and, and you know, architecture, interior, and landscape, but also the sort of larger group. Functionality, we wanted a space, that, that, that space actually works quite well from a functional point of view because you can have the gantry crane at around 30 feet and still have walking aisles on the side, runs the entire length. So you can basically put that gantry crane almost at any height, we just put it at 30, uh, and actually have that go end to end across the space. Daylighting, think of the, pan think of the Pantheon in Rome, you have a single thing, a small sort of oculus at the top and then a very large volume below. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but that type of space that's larger at the bottom allows for very even daylighting throughout the space. So we can have a diffuse light source that isn't that big and have great daylighting all the way to the shop floor. Thermal comfort, that shape works in terms of a stack effect. And also, I, I'll talk more detail about how that works as a sort of a passive way of creating um, uh, mechanical ventilation throughout the space. Public visibility. One of the things that you've challenged us is how do we make the innovation in this building transparent to the community? And that idea of the hall, the sort of end-to-end -end, uh, um, visibility, this is the view from the Walmart parking lot across the street. And you can see completely through the building. You see the gantry crane, the two yellow pieces there, the fans circulating the air, and that, what you see in the front there is actually the exhibit space. Objects that happen on the um, fabrication hall floor can actually be taken via the gantry to that exhibit space and really be put on display to the wider community. We are proposing that all of the beams, the columns, the floors, are made with Arkansas Glue Lamb, stock Arkansas Glue Lamb that is available in the state today. And we could get it made if I told them tomorrow we're doing it, it, it arrive on site in three months. And I'll ex explain to you sort of how we've gone about that. And that connects us back to what I started with, this idea of choices connecting you to the landscape and to um, issues such as rural, urban economic development, and bigger issues such as climate change. This is a map of the trees in Arkansas, uh, and I think I'll have Susanna talk a bit more about site, right? Yeah, I'll talk about site. Um, so, so, you know, that last map showed kind of the, the trees and the, um, the broader landscape in a uh, kind of abstract way. This is another abstraction. Um, showing all the different ecological zones uh, in Arkansas. And you can see there's just an incredible diversity. And some of that's related to the geology, and some of that is related to the soils, obviously in the alluvial plain, and, and some of that is related to elevation um, and the amount of moisture that, that the different trees are getting. But the cool thing is that our site, you know, up here in Fayetteville, is sort of right on the cusp of two different um, ecosystems. The predominant uh, sort of forest uh, in this zone is this hoak, uh, 
uh, oak hickory forest, I'm making up new hybrids. Um, um, and this is a mature forest, and it's this beautiful mature canopy with these um, tall, um, tall mature hardwoods and a, a relatively low understory. And I think one of the things that we're excited about expressing potentially in the design is some ideas of how you know the trees start small um, and, and might go through a succession. Um, this is a, showing just an example of, of ecological succession. But we want to represent these different landscapes um, in, in the site. And one of the things that got us really excited about, about working here, well, um, is that that uh, it's a has this legacy as a land grant university, um, and um, the old main lawn um, acts as a, a kind of arboretum with these giant um, hardwood trees, and then there's another arboretum area around the the stadium, and so we saw this opportunity to potentially create kind of another arboretum. Um, maybe down on, on our site, sort of adding to the diversity of the kinds of different landscapes that might be represented. In this case, looking at a landscape of the, the sort of industrial trees, the trees that you're using for, for our building, right? Uh, and we also saw some really incredible kind of larger connections with the, the sort of pathways that um, connect the site, the connections to the Razorback Greenway. You know, perhaps there could be um, things constructed in the fabrication lab that end up, you know, getting disseminated around the Greenway as, as student projects. Um, and so getting into the site, though, um, we're looking at the existing, this is the existing condition, and you can see that we have the sculpture and the foundations um, building and the library storage with the, um, the uh, uh, Salagi Trail on the, on the south side, um, bordered by Martin Luther King and, um, and govern government. Uh, our site sits at a really important corner um, uh, strategically for the campus. Um, and it'll be important as a corner for the whole sort of arts quad. You know, this is a, a slightly informal arts quad. I guess it's a little bit more contained than some of the other, uh, other sort of informal geometric quads around the campus, but it's, it still creates this really um, wonderful kind of um, space in the center um, with access from Martin Luther King through the site. Um, here you can see we have uh, the bus stop and, and the walkway down to our building. Uh, and there's a, a pathway in between uh, the arts building, the phase two arts building, and uh, a kind of working landscape of the, the site. And then a very important kind of visual corridor uh, from Martin Luther King through the building into seeing that working um, area. This is the working landscape where things will be fabricated outside. And then our idea is that this center arboretum is the kind of connector for the working landscape and this future landscape of the arts building. And that this landscape on this hill uh, might be more of an a representation of the understory of, uh, of a, a large canopy forest. So here you can see what that might kind of look like uh, in plan with this, the arts court uh, this arboretum in the center, uh, some kind of bleacher-like stairs, amphitheater-like stairs, so you can check out what's going on in the fabrication area. And then we have these sponge landscapes in the front. The idea is that, that these landscapes will help to filter um, the large rain events that you get um, and cleanse the water going into the water table. Here you can see a vision of what we're thinking. Uh, the, the campus is kind of characteristic of the, um, the park a character of, um, that's written into the design standards for the campus uh, with a, 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 a ground plane probably of grass in this area with the larger trees and then other areas on the slope with more ground covers. And here you can see a vision of uh, the building uh, with the landscape in the foreground. These are these um, sponge landscapes that will absorb the sort of major rain events that you get. And then this sloping path where you're kind of walking through uh, these understory trees. So, thank you. So I'm gonna talk about the building massing because we've actually spent um, a, a lot of time thinking about how to make uh, the form of the building build on the shapes of the other buildings in the court. And while the, the form is pretty simple, 
there's, there's, we've gone through a number of iterations to arrive where we're at. I mean, one of the key things that we understood about the program is you want this building to have presence in an urban presence. So actually, on the northeast corner, it rises up to its highest point. But you also want it to connect, uh, let's see if I can get this to work, which is the pointer, oh, there it is. You want it to connect and kind of create a gateway with the building that's adjoining. So it actually, at the highest point here, and it slopes down and sort of lines up with the building here. But, and then on the courtyard side, we wanted to push it down so we can actually have a space in the landscape that feels human scaled. So there, it's all one plane, but it's doing many things. And the, the benefit of this massing is it's also actually optimized for um, solar. So it's basically taking something, tilting it to the south, and then slightly tilting it to the west. So I love when one move does many things, and that's really sort of at the heart of the massing of how we've kind of come to that in the building. And, and, and then, and so the organization of the space starts with what I talked about previously, this idea of the fabrication hall, which is almost like if you think of a forest, it's the leftover space between the canopies, right? You know, you have the structure and then you have the space in between. And in that central space, you have truck access that you can drive right in from the south. And then you have that exhibit space that's elevated that we saw when we were seeing that view from across the way. And sort of in a simple way, you think access of materials, things get built, they might go to the exhibit. And then on the west side facing the landscape that Susanna just talked about, we have a more public, uh, public program. We have the auditorium, we have the library, we have the cafe underneath. We have views from the auditorium um, right into uh, the fab yard. It would be like if behind the screen was a window that looked out into a covered porch where people could build. And on the east side, we have maybe the more, quote, private spaces stacked up, the labs, the classrooms, and the residence. And if you think about that relative to massing, right, you have the auditorium and these sort of small programs just down here, lower and more connected to the landscape, and then they sort of rise up, so you end up with a five-story building at the, at the peak. But I, I mean, just one thing I want to note, it, it, we keep coming back to the concept of creating a space that will drive interaction, that earlier diagram I showed you. So we, we want to do that at the level of the building so we can actually um, really fulfill the function of having a place that really uh, fosters innovation. So earlier, Susanna talked to you about the level of innovation at the scale of the district and at the scale of the project site itself. And Thomas talked about how we design spaces so we're organizing them to foster innovation at a really high level. I'm going to take you through the building sort of room by room. Um, and show you what's happening inside the building. But even though I'm going room by room, I'm not gonna tell you like, this is the innovation room, because there is no innovation room, right? It's not how it works. Innovation happens when people get together and collaborate and share ideas and just share the same space to inspire one another. And there's a little bit of magic in that. We can't design that magic, but we can design spaces that are engaging and really inspire you. Uh, so this is the site plan you saw first when Susanna showed it to you. Uh, what you're looking at here is the arboretum that's sort of in the center of the arts district. And as you look through the space, you see the courtyard, you see people making, you see the fab yard that's sort of under this deep porch cover under the building. And then you see the fabrication hall itself. So as we stand there and look back at the building, what you see is this really um, beautifully articulated wooden facade you see the solar panels on top. You see that deep porch that I was talking about. And where we want to go next is we want to head over to where that truck is and sort of stand right in front of the fab space again. So as you stand there looking into this space with these big doors, you see this giant volume. And you notice that it's really, it's not defined by walls. It's defined by the structure. 
you see the skylights above, and they're really bringing in this diffuse light that has sort of a soft glow on this beautiful wood. You see the fans up above mixing the air. You see the gantry crane. You see students walking around the perimeter of the space, going between classes. When you look at the ground level, there's a lot more activity happening. Out in the distance, you can actually see the exhibit space. It's on the MLK side of the building. And those folks have a view directly into the fabrication yard. In the foreground, there's a team assembling a mass plywood pavilion. And in the background, you see and hear the robots start to whir and start to cut pieces of timber. And you see sawdust flying. You can smell the wood. And it's really exciting. You can see a student off to the right, and they're, they're cutting in the metal shop. And then off to the left, you'll start to see um, the exterior of the fab yard. So again, everything's organized around the fabrication hall. All of these specialty shops have direct physical access and visual connection back to what's happening in the fab yard, in the fab hall. The reason that's important is because as students, you're all going to be making with different materials, you'll be making at different scales, but you're all sharing the same space. So you can see what else is happening and what other cool things are inspiring you to push your work even further. So we turn to the left and we kind of look out from inside the fab hall, look through the yard. You can see the arboretum in the distance. You can see students milling around. But from this space, you can also see up at the top, you see into the library, you see into the auditorium, and you see into the cafe at the ground floor. This is a great place where materials can be stored and really large scale art and architecture uh, installations can be built under this deep porch cover where they're protected. So again, the fabrication hall, fabrication yard, and the landscape are really well connected. There's an entry into the cafe from the yard, and the cafe is then connected back into the fab hall. But what's really great is there's a lower level entry that's over at the corner of MLK and government, where it's probably going to be used mostly by students to get to offices and visit with professors, but it also brings you right back to the cafe. And that's really where probably I would go first. It's because I got to get coffee before I go to class. So next you'll see one level up is the formal lobby that's right off of MLK. That has a connection uh, into the cafe, you'll see it, uh, and then also has a, a ramp that takes you right up into the auditorium. It's connected um, to the exhibition gallery and there's a generous porch in front of it as well. Once you're in the auditorium, you have really great views out into the landscape and also back into the fabrication yard and the hall. Everything is really well connected. That in that section, you can just see how generous the glazing is that gives you a really good view of the activity happening behind the speaker. The library is just south of the auditorium, has the same kind of views into the yard and into the landscape. And you can see here in this section how it's so well protected by that overhang. So it's right over the fab yard, it's under a porch, and it's a great place to study and research. This is a view of the model of the exhibit space. It's a really special space because it's very public, publicly visible. It's on MLK. It's very transparent, and it has spectacular views out to the making that's happening in the fabrication hall. It's uh, acoustically connected to the fabrication hall, so the gantry crane actually extends into that space. So you can pick something up from the floor of the hall and bring it in and set it down in the exhibit space for display. It's connected back to the main lobby as well. And those, uh, this is just to show you how long those views are through the space, all the way through the building. We come up one floor, we're on the third floor, we're looking out into the fab hall, and we're seeing directly into all the classrooms. So these are labs, studios, classrooms, all of these spaces. You can see all the activity happening. You see people pinning up for crits. You see models being made. And you can also see students occupying all of the spaces around the perimeter of the fabrication hall. So the interstitial spaces are also really important. So in this plan, you see that those uh, labs, classrooms, and studios are pushed out, and the circulation is right at the perimeter. One floor up, you'll see the seminar spaces on the fourth floor. Those are slightly smaller rooms, more focused small group work for brainstorming, uh, working in a team or working individually. And again, you start to see students occupying those interstitial spaces for contemplation, rest. You can pin up work. You can work with your friends. So this is that plan showing the seminar spaces. Those are actually pushed right out to the perimeter, so there's not circulation in front of them. And they have this really great view, because the glazing is so angled, they have a really great view out into the fabrication hall. 
One floor up from that is the roof deck and the visiting faculty residence. And in section, you see that that roof deck and residence are stacked right above all the classrooms. So as you come out to the fifth floor and you step out onto this roof deck, you have this really incredible long view all the way out to the Boston Mountains. It's a really special space. It could be used for celebrations or collaboration, but it's also a really good place for engagement because there's visiting faculty staying in the residence right next door. This would be a great place for students to be able to engage with those visiting faculty uh, in a different way than you see them in studio every day. In this view, you can actually see the roof deck off to the left, sort of glowing at night. But you see into this building, it's so transparent and so flexible. At the ground level, you can look back into the specialty shops on the ground floor. You can look into the porch, into the exhibit space, and you can see all the making that's happening. This project is so much more than just a building. It's really a lot, a series of connections between all these ideas that you have, all the people, and all of the program spaces. But moreover, it's a connection because of its transparency and welcoming. It's a connection from the university all the way back to the community. Thank you, Chandra. So we've talked about um, the landscape, the organization, and now I want to explain sort of our approach to building systems, what we call the project ecosystem. Um, and I think it's something that we spent a, a lot of time with during the kind of initial design phases, really just talking what the, about the goals and talking about the climate and how we could create a building that is, in a way, balanced. Um, and we started with kind of the ground and, and the earth. Um, Northwest Arkansas is, is incredibly, uh, uh, you know, geothermal is a great thing that you can actually do here in Northwest Arkansas. And I think that uh, it's something that we want to consider for this project. We actually um, talked to our local partners and asked, like, well, why haven't there been more geothermal projects done sort of at a larger scale? And basically, the, the thing that, that everyone said, it was just too much money. Um, so we, we said, well, we, we did some research and we found that the local electrical cooperative is actually offering low interest loans and incentives for people to do geothermal because it's incredibly efficient. We think for this project, um, it might be worth that effort. Site, Susanna um, talked about the sponge landscape and, and there's some bigger issues around that. Um, the EPA has identified that the greatest risk to Arkansas due to climate change is um, storm events. You know, and I've actually been in one and they're kind of frightening. <laughs> you know, the amount of rain you get in a short period of time. So the building itself and the design of the landscape can be balanced to actually mitigate those events. And the shape of the roof, it all actually ends up in those planters, the three planters, which can be quite deep and actually mitigate the initial storm surge. Structure, we're talking about mass timber. We're talking about, and there's a carbon story to mass timber, and that carbon story is really the thing that most people are really excited about that aren't in architecture school. <laughs> and so this building, is um, 433,000 board feet of glue lamb sourced from Arkansas. That's 1.3 million pounds of carbon sequestered. It's the equivalent of taking 129 cars off the road for one year. The facade, the most sustainable thing you can do in many respects is to design with the climate in mind and with the orientations in mind. And we worked closely within our team and with Thomas Auer to come up with a facade system that's flexible. You sort of saw the way it can be a veil, but also really being thoughtful about, you know, the south facade is pretty solid except for that door. Um, we have a porch on that side that's actually exterior. So, you know, mitigating and thinking about how much, how much, uh, how many openings do we put in each facade and really thinking about shade. <coughs> And then solar, I talked about the massing and, and that idea of it addressing both urban and um, environmental issues. The array on this um, building uh, can generate over 500,000 kilowatts, kilowatt hours per year. 
with our calculations and with the building system I'm going to show you after these slides, we can reach a net positive building um, for the operations of the building. If you're running the plasma cutter all night, it's not going to work. Um, but I think that for the building operations itself, we're very confident that we can do that. How can we do that? I'm going to get into more detail here. Uh, this is a section through the building looking north. On, on the left there is the auditorium. Below here is uh, the cafe. This is the fab floor. The exhibits are here. That's the ramp that sort of comes up to the stage of the auditorium here. And then you have the, the classrooms and sort of the more occupiable places stacked to the east. This is how the system works. What we have is um, fresh air coming through a series of louvers directly into a decentralized system that's connected to the geothermal loop that heats or cools the air specifically for the spaces that people are occupying on both sides, the auditorium, the cafe, and the classrooms. And then that air is actually pulled uh, into the central fabrication space, both by the stack effect of the space as hot air rises, it wants to escape, but also from mechanical units that you see up top here. And that's pulled through an acoustic duct, which you'll see in the renderings that Chandra showed that's actually pulling the air across and into the space, into the central space. That air is then being mixed with the fans coming down um, and um, touching the slab, which is either cooled um, in summer and heated in winter. Um, that allows for more temperature fluctuation in the fab space, and we think that's fine. That's a fabrication space and a lot of control in the, in the surrounding areas. And in the shoulder seasons and sometimes a year, this building can work completely passively. And that's sort of how we were able to actually create a building in terms of its operation that can be um, more than net zero. So frame assembly. How do we put this building together? I talked about the idea of using stock Arkansas glue lamb. And it's really, you know, about sort of how we approach these buildings here and now, um, you know, at least in our region. And, and I want to show you how we've applied those ideas um, here. Because when we're thinking about a building, we think about the design and the kind of experience, but we're immediately almost going to the opposite end. So it's like when you go and cook a meal, you don't like cook the steak halfway. You know, you cook it all the way, right? And you taste it and decide, is that something that's good or not? And so I think of, that's how we think about, in a way, our design process. We want to actually do those sort of trials. We want to go all the way to the end. I'm going to show you how we've done that. In terms of the ingredients that we're working with, we looked at, you know, what's available relative to mass timber in Arkansas today. Um, and, and also to, in the past, I mean, at one time, ArcLam was the largest custom glue lamb um, fabricator in the United States. Uh, they made crystal bridges, glue lamb beams. Um, we also have a very, uh, you know, high quality stock glue lamb manufacturer, um, Anthony Forest Products. And we said, well, that seems like that would be something that we could work with, because we've done that before in, in Portland for a project called Flex. So we said, let's start with their, um, with their, their catalog of, of stock glue lambs. And what I'm going to do is show you how we um, we would build it, uh, build with that stock glue. And so this is the frame uh, of the overall structure. And I'm going to focus in on a small piece of it and show you how we put that together. This is the, um, this is the catalog of glue lamps that are available. Um, the, they come in different um, widths. And we immediately went to the widest, which is 10 and 3 quarters inch. And it comes in 16 different sizes from 30 inch all the way down. So we said, we're going to need that 30 inch deep glue lamb that's 10 and 3 quarters. So we took that. Then we took a 21 inch deep glue lamb, which is for sort of the shorter spans, which are you know, between the angled pieces and the columns at the perimeter. And then we have our columns, which are 15 inch deep. And then we have the 12 inch deep ones that are for the angled elements. So we have four pieces of glue lamb for the entire frame. And we called them up, and they said, well, how long? Can you make your glue limbs? And they said, we can make them 60 feet, but you, if they're over that, if they're over 52, you have to have a special truck. So it's like, let's stick with 52, right? So we don't have to deal with that. But the great thing about them being 60 feet long, that they can make that, we could actually cut 
one glue lamb in half and end up with two 29-foot glue lambs. And that allowed us to make 28-foot two-story columns, which if you're working with mass timber is what you want to do. If you can only place the column once, because that's where actually the work, you can actually speed up the process. So we've got two lifts of two 28-story columns. We put up eight of those columns. We bring in our 30-inch deep glue lambs. And if you look at the detail that we, um, we, uh, we were doing for this project out on, in the exhibit, you can actually bring the columns in from the side because it's actually an in cut and sitting on the end grain. We put those four columns in. We take the angled element and we use this sort of simple dado simplex connection that we can easily put together on the ground. And then we put those up. So we've gotten two stories of the structure up. And then we think about the floors. So we went back to the catalog and said, well, okay, there's a, they have a five and a half inch wide beam, which is pretty similar to CLT depth, right? And we said, what's their deepest beam? It's 30 inches, we'll take that. We know it comes in up to 60 feet. We're gonna take 45 feet, um, and then we're gonna flip it on its side. We're gonna add another one. We're gonna CNC a, a series of dowels, oak dowels, and then we're gonna put that together, and we're gonna have a five foot by 45 foot long panel. We're gonna take that panel, put it on the truck, and then we're gonna put that as our floor. We're going to leave six inch gaps between each panel to allow for sprinklers and lighting to run so you can actually run transverse to the beams. And then we're going to, we're going to propose to do a topping slab. And I know there are dry systems out there, but we still think um, this, a topping slab is the way to go. Because it's a topping slab, we can actually replace 70% of the concrete in the topping slab with recycled ash, slag, recycled glass because we can have a longer curing time. And it's really great for vibration, acoustics, and you can have a great wearing service. And I'm sure the students will treat the floor really well here, so it's nice to have something that's kind of indestructible here. Uh, this is, we do the next lift of columns. So this is all, these, those columns are continuous, right? So we're just putting the other set of columns in, topping slab, other set of columns, we can do columns up to 52 feet long if we need to. Um, another set, another topping slab, the roof, and then same thing um, with the seal, with the, with the uh, glue laminated uh, uh, roof um, where we, you know, we don't need a topping slab on that. This is the whole frame. And then this is the sort of prototype detail that we came to. Um, and what we did is we're like, well, let's try to work with um, our fabricators to understand how we could build this detail. And what's been interesting for me personally is as we've done mass timber projects, our details get simpler and simpler. The first ones, everything was concealed and there was a zillion parts. And then the next one, we eliminated a little bit more steel. This one has like one little screw and a piece of steel in it. And actually the one we're doing for Adidas has absolutely no steel in it. It's just resting on a major beam. So because we found it's like really expensive to do a lot of machining on these details. So we wanted to try to make sure that they would work. This is the mock-up you see, and this is in Stefan um, with, his, with his, this is like his kid, this cruisy machine. You know, he's in there like <laughs> um, always trying to figure it out. Uh, and, you know, Samantha here working on the mock-up that just came out and putting it together. And I'm going to show you here um, the machining, you know, that we did. And that's actually the machining of that angled part right there. And then you can see that we're machining the end columns. And what's exciting about this, and this is half scale, so the cuts would be much deeper, is if you look at traditional um, joinery, uh, so much of it is bearing on end grain, because it's a really great way to do wood. And so we really were kind of inspired by that to think about how we could kind of do a, a system of, of, of connections that are incredibly simple. So how does that then translate to Arkansas? So we looked and said, you know, who, who is this, the Cut My Timber sort of in this region? And what was pretty interesting is we came across a company called Satter Timber. And they're about 10 hours from Fayetteville, so not that far in Tennessee. And Reinhard Satter is actually the first sort of um, technically, you know, um, 
complex CNC shop in the United States. So they actually have more experience than pretty much anyone else in this. And they have a brand new Hundiger. And so we said, we called, I called Reinhardt, I sent him our 3D model, I talked to him about the, uh, you know, the glue lamb floor, and he's like, oh, that's a great idea. Um, and, he, and he gave us a quote for the whole building structure. So I'm just gonna kinda go through it here. Okay, so he had 432,545 board feet. So this is all the glue lamb for the, all the structure. And, you know, it varies from, he said, yeah, probably from 290 to 350 of board feet. I bet you the university can get a better price than this. It's probably retail, but uh, that was 1.3 million. Uh, the glue lamb fabrication, so that's for all the, the joints and the um, elements we talked about. I actually think it would probably end up being less because what we're doing is quite simple compared to a lot of uh, sections. That's 159,000. And then what was fascinating to us is we he actually provided us a quote for CLT and he's like, oh, you're doing glue lamb. I don't, I don't need to charge you a dollar. I can do a 60, 60 cents a board foot for fabrication. So 40% less in terms of the fabrication time. And, and that's 168,000. And then it takes 26 trucks. Uh, that's you know $1,200 a pop, and it was 1.7 million. So that's just to give you kind of a sense. You know, we can't necessarily hold Reinhardt to this right away, but but I want to demonstrate like the idea of really getting to the end to understand: Are you sort of in the ballpark? You know, can you make this happen? So the facade. We were inspired by something that happened here in Arkansas. Um, so Edward Durrell Stone, who you know, is a, a famous architect who went to the school here, and Senator Fulbright um, from, you know, very, uh, you also probably know who he is from the Fulbright program. Uh, they got together in the 1950s to uh, produce a line of furniture that um, Edward Durrell Stone designed for um, a factory that the Fulbright family owned I, um, after World War II. And they, weren't, they didn't have as much work, so they, they came, he came up with this design where you're sort of using uh, regional hardwoods, but also this sort of basket weaving oak strip um, tradition that's been around for over 100 years here locally. And that ethic was something that really was exciting to us. And we're thinking, for the facade, could we do something similar. So we looked around and looked at the various um, hardwoods that were available and you know we looked at uh, you know you almost love saying the names it's like you know white oak, red oak, gum and ash and you know there's all these different trees and and black locust sort of came to the top and and there's been a lot of really visionary work on the part of some landscape architects to finding an alternative to tropical hardwoods and Black locust is really America's original hardwood. Native Americans used it to make their bows. It was used in Jamestown. It's incredibly durable stuff. Uh, it doesn't need a finish. And it's actually an invasive species, so it's good to cut it down sometimes. <laughs> um, so we thought, could we combine using black locust, which is now available from Roby Decking out of North Carolina, and I know, um, you know, um, it's been recently used on other projects. And then thinking about, there's a company called Wright, White River Hardwood that does incredibly complex moldings here in Fayetteville, and to have them potentially machine this facade out of black locust. So this is sort of the general idea, and I wanted to talk here about, um, this is just a little diagram showing that behind this screen, there's a lot of opportunity for opaque opacity. So that's the screen. Um, and some areas will be completely opaque or have louvers around it. And then the thought of the facade having this character um, of the, uh, uh, the black locusts and sort of these overlapping elements to create a screen uh, on the building. You can sort of see that in the model. I don't think the model ever wanted to be this big, but we're showing you exactly how it's made. Um, and then the character of that facade in the evening. This is the porch where all the um, outdoor materials could be stored, that it has a very different character in the day and in the evening. And then you can see a truck coming early in the morning or late at night. Interiors. We have a director of interiors in our office. Uh, we, um, and we're really, 
we think of uh, how we can integrate the interiors in the building. And, and really the same ethic about the, the Ozark, Ozark Modern Furniture applied here. On the upper left is a, a house that a friend of mine owns designed by a famous architect in Portland, Pietro Beluski, and it's, and it's a woven um, wood roof, really beautiful, inspired by Japanese um, uh, spaces. And, and it sort of reminded us of the, the, you know, the basket weaving. We thought, well, could we do something similar for the auditorium? Something, if you were here, you would have this beautiful woven white oak roof floating above you. And then we found this, this company called Assemblage, which makes amazing wallpaper, beautiful, as you can see it on the upper right there, that maybe that could be something. They're also based in Arkansas, and that could be something we could use for the residents. And then we know that Anthony Timberlands has incredible resources relative to white oak, and we could use end grain white oak for the public spaces. So project cost. This is our office at Barney Yard. It was, um, it was $200 a square foot three years ago. This is the Nature Conservancy, which is using FSC certified CLT, regional um, use of uh, a wood called juniper, which is actually also a native invasive species in Oregon, <laughs> which we really need to find a use for. This was uh, $360 a square foot. This is Flex. This was the project I mentioned earlier. This is using all stock glue lamb. It's the x lamb product by Roseboro. Uh, and you know, this was $195 a square foot. It's a, it's a, you know, a shell and core, so obviously there's the fit out that would go on top of that. This is Adidas. I can't really tell you how much it costs, but it's in the range of your budget. It's a very innovative project, over 200,000 square foot for the office building and about a half a million for the whole project. Um, a hybrid of wood and, and actually precast concrete. want to be able to engage with all of the students in the design process and we've thought about a couple of ways that we can potentially do that um, one way is through studios another way is this idea about a field school that we've come up with and it requires more thinking with you involved and with faculty involved to really determine what are the parts of it that are going to best serve your school the thought behind the field school is really kind of based on um, what I've done before in geology. So in geology, you go to field school, you go out in the field, you do measurements, you take samples, and you do all this work out in the world that you bring back into the labs to really dissect. So for a field school related to the forest to frame concept, there would be a track one, which would be sort of symposium and panel kind of discussions. We would bring in experts in the mass timber industry and have them talk about what the cutting edge technologies are that they're using. There would be demonstrations in the fabrication hall of these new systems that they're using. And that would really allow people from the industry to come here to the University of Arkansas. And it's a way for the university to really demonstrate their leadership in this field. The other track, track two, would be smaller groups and they would be a little bit more focused, and these would be the field trip portions. So this could be you know, a 10-day seminar where we go out into the field and we talk to a forester about what are the methods for sustainable, sustainably managing working forests in Arkansas. We could go to a mill, we could go to a manufacturing plant, and find out how all of those people are working today and what technologies we can bring back to the studio to really think about and process and innovate from. Because innovation is all about taking what you have now and what you know and pushing it just a little bit farther and a little bit farther and a little bit farther until you create something new. <clears throat> so these are kind of the two ideas that we have about how we're gonna work with you. Um, I want to build on um, what Chandra was saying is that uh, I'm personally incredibly excited to come back and teach studios that align with the sort of key phases of this building, the programming, uh, the design, and documentation. And the thing I'm actually most excited about is to teach a studio um, during the construction phase, because that's such an unusual opportunity, and I love construction. <laughs> uh, and 
So I think there's something kind of incredible about that opportunity, but I, I want to point out is the reason that we propose this idea of the field school and go back to this idea of these two tracks is a studio is only like 15 people. We'd like to really bring these ideas and allow sort of the wider school and the wider community to have access to them. Kind of you. That, that I could also potentially enrich these studios uh, as a landscape architect, potentially as something, you know, some sort of visiting scholar, potentially lecturing or participating in reviews, doing desk crits, um, helping out with field trips, just being engaged because we're going to be here. And if we're here, we want to work with you. And, and what's better than working with the students and the faculty at such an incredible university? So in summary, uh, and it's been probably a long six presentations, so you guys are like, let's get excited. <laughs> We're very close to the end, almost to. Um, in summary, um, engagement equals innovation. I, I think I like this image because it's not about architecture, it's about engagement and engaging in that landscape, engaging on the landscape level. Uh, Engaging in terms of the systems, but making it beautiful. The sponge parks can be beautiful. Uh, it's about inspiration, about creating spaces that inspire, um, that people want to work in, that people um, that represent who they are, their state, that make them proud. Um, it's about then connecting that back to the landscape. You know. I think there's this power of being in the landscape and looking into and through a building and being in the building and looking out into the landscape. The idea of creating a space that encourages serendipitous um, conversations, meetings, you know, you see somebody across the room and you were thinking about something and that triggers a solution, it triggers the desire to go talk to them and that moves your work forward. We want to create that opportunity within a very sort of rational plan that's also very flexible. And sometimes you just need a place to escape. And the roof deck for us is that place where you can actually reconnect with what matters, with the landscape. Uh, Chandra talked about that idea of having places where it's not necessarily a classroom. It's a place in between. And, a roof deck, uh, to me, is that type of place. And sometimes the most important conversations happen in the places where they're not supposed to or planned to. Um, you know, I think your vision for the Anthony Timberland Center is bold, and it's inspired our team to rise to the challenge, to create a bold, an innovative design that will bring distinction to the Faye Jones School of Architecture, to the university, and to the state of Arkansas. We want to inspire students and faculty to imagine the world anew with a deep understanding that materials matter, that poetics and pragmatism, beauty and utility, and an economy of means can be drivers of exceptional design that recognizes the impact our material choices have on our region, our, for our children, and the health of the planet we all share. Thank you. All right, you're done. <laughs> no, no, still question and answer, some dialogue. Please, uh, to uh, bring this uh, to some form of at least open-ended uh, conclusions. Questions? Yes, in the center. Practicing architects talk passionately about their projects um, as an example for us students. My question is, I am curious about the day-to-day -day functionality of a space which celebrates fabrication in that grand hall, but when you also have um, big audience halls like this one, and studio spaces and classroom spaces, you are talking um, very, like, 
about the connection between the fabrication spaces and the openness of exposed structure in the wood. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about how you mitigate the loudness of CNC mills and yeah. plasma cutters with what is a very open plan. I mean, the, 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 the simplest conversation is that is the things that make the most noises are in enclosed spaces. So if you look back at the plan of the building, uh, you know, whether they're all glass or not is not for us to decide right at this point. But I think from an acoustic point of view, the difference between a door that's an inch open and a door that's closed is, is huge. So what we've tried to do with the shops, they're actually in enclosed spaces, but they have the ability to open onto the fabrication hall. So the fabrication hall is really more of a place of assembly and small power tools. The really kind of noisy things aren't there. And, and you know, I also think it's sometimes it's great, it's this type of space, it's great uh, to have the hum. You know, this is a space where things are happening. And you know, I, our, my friend Stefan has a robot arm, I didn't show you pictures of it, pretty much exactly what you're looking at on track. And it's not crazy, crazy um, noisy, you know. So I think, uh, you know, we've actually thought a lot about the acoustic issues. I mean, I think for the spaces and classrooms, we would probably do insulated glazing facing that space, um, but that's not such a big deal. Um, and it's a good question, because it's something that has come up in our minds as well. Um, but we think there's a good balance you can strike, and we, you know, we work with acoustical engineers to really sort of understand exactly what's sort of um, at a point where sound is not productive anymore, you know? So hopefully that answers your question. Thanks very much. Other questions? Pragmatic or poetic. Can I add one thing to that? So, you know, the, the transfer ducts that we're talking about? So that's what we, we have here. And the idea is you have an opening on one side, and then this is acoustic liner, duct liner, and then it opens on the other side. So that, you know, any sound that's actually in that space doesn't transfer through to that duct. So that's something that it's a little dorky detail, but that's basically what we're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Please. Hi, um, I'm Miller. I'm a fifth year architect. I didn't, I don't really have a question. I um, was just really amazed by the presentation. I just want to commend you guys on the design. Uh, the clarity of the work and the thoughtfulness and um, the, um, the sectional clarity is really gorgeous. Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty wild through and through with everything that you guys have done. I'm just kind of hoping that this gets built. <laughs> <laughs> we do too. <laughs> That's really nice. <laughs> it's like a town hall. We're taking votes. Uh, I think there was a question here. I don't know if, I, I talked about this with Russell Rudzinski the other night. Some people might be, in this audience, might be old enough to remember a talk show host named Phil Donahue, who ran around with a microphone the whole time. So. Hi, um, my name's Sarah. I'm a fourth year architecture student. I was just, um, first of all, I just wanted to say that I really appreciate the amount of research and thoughtfulness that you had in relation to uh, your site and just the way you approach the building. Um, I don't believe I caught it, but what kind of material did you use for the exterior cladding and how do you anticipate that weathering? Um, we're thinking of uh, using black locust, which is uh, wood that's native to Arkansas and it's available for decking right now through a company called Roby Decking. And if you go over to you know the student, um, housing that was recently completed, you'll actually see it. Um, I see it installed. Um, it's sort of an end grain product. But it's, it's, it's so durable that you can actually put it outside <laughs> um, in gravel, <laughs> you know, without any finish. So I think the idea with the wearing of it is that it would, you know, with the, uh, the facade, I mean, sort of, we tried to indicate it here, is that, you know, um, this area that's sort of more exposed would wear faster than the area where it overlaps. So over time, that would slowly kind of become almost like a 
the tide rising on the wearing of the space. So we were also really keen on, we didn't get into some of the detail that we were thinking about, is like if we can machine that, we, we, you know, if you look at our work and our website, we're really keen on, you know, if, whether it's in metal, of machining custom profiles for our facades to kind of get a richer effect, but we were thinking we could machine almost like a chevron-shaped um, element, so, and that, then we would flip it as you went up the building, so it would have a sense of uh, a richer character. Thank you. Just to follow on that, uh, Thomas, the, because if that's applied to every uh, facade, north, south, east, and west, will it weather differently? Do you, would, how would that, in a sense, occur over time? I mean, I, I think that, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it probably would weather differently. I mean, like the south, southern side, you know, would probably have this, at least in uh, the west, we get these sort of, the southern side gets this amazing kind of burnt, not burnt look, but kind of a bright look, you know, and then the northern side would probably um, stay quite a bit darker. So, uh, yeah, I think it would wear weather differently. And, and we, we, I think if we've been researching using this material and we really want to, I don't think it's been done, but it's been proven that this material can be outside. I mean, w working with the wood, we worked with Juniper on the Nature Conservancy, and you know, you have to be really respectful of these kind of squirrely woods, you know, and how you attach them. <laughs> you know, it's funny, there's, like on the Nature Conservancy, we do the tongue and groove with Juniper, and we only attach it with one stainless steel screw, you know, because the wood moves, so if you have two, it'll crack it apart. So just like simple stuff like that that you learn when you actually really get into the, the nitty gritty of working with these types of materials. Yes. A little bit more volume, Brian. I think I know microphone's coming down to you, but thanks. Um, so uh, well, it all makes sense. Um, but I was, <laughs> but um, glad it's good that it makes sense because we'd be in trouble. Therapeutic validation I mean, to Thomas Robinson. It, yeah, um, I, I was wondering if you could <clears throat> share with us some of your thoughts on uh, like uh, water drainage, like getting it from the roof down into those those marshes. Yeah, I um, well, that's a good slide to show. Uh, so basically, you know, all the water is going to kind of come to this end of the roof and more towards this end. So the idea is we'd have uh, a very, quite a large drain pipe in that sort of outdoor storage space that would dump into these two um, uh, what we call flow through planners um, in Oregon and, or sponge landscapes. You want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. Well, one of the, the things that we found in, in doing these kinds of, of uh, landscapes where you're taking water off an elevated surface and then bringing it into a, um, a basin like this, an open basin, is that you need to have a pretreatment area. So, and that takes out all the sort of fine sediment because you, know, you wouldn't think about it, but there is stuff floating around in the air that'll get into the water and then it can clog your green infrastructure. So you put in a pretreatment system, you know, which could be beautiful rocks, gravel, something really nice. Um, and then the water will flow through that and then to the planting. So, and we can design it so that that's actually very easy to maintain um, as well. We've done enough of these now that we, we kind of figured it out. Um, but, um, but it's not detailed in these drawings, these are schematic. But, but we would definitely be spending a lot of time on that, figuring that out. Yeah, I, I mean, I just want to, I brought up this slide because this is the idea that you almost, you have this single ply roof, I don't know how familiar people are, and then we basically put the solar panels on top of it, so we create this sort of zone. Uh, and that actually works from a kind of, it's almost like a heat shield, <laughs> in a way that will allow air to circulate under it, and it's actually a really economical roof to do, and then you can have these big gutters where all the water can come down to these zones here, and then actually then flow to the front of the building directly into those planners. Can we, can we assume that that's a, those gutters are designed for the worst case scenario? Yes. Well, I mean, <laughs> we're going to have big scuppers, you know, then they'll be shooting water out when you have the crazy. I actually went to Mar one of Marlon's buildings and he was so excited because it was raining like crazy and the building was just like spouting water. <laughs> well, and we, we can also calculate the, the um, 
the volume of water that the basins absorb. I mean, we tend to work to a state standard and calculate, you know, for a 1.2 inch storm. I would assume we should, you know, calculate for a much bigger storm, like anticipate the really yeah. major storms, and because uh, I don't want it to overflow. So. Other questions? Good questions. At the, yes. So I think y'all have clearly, um, the way that y'all are addressing MLK with the design is very direct, but in terms of the, the facade and the way that the program is laid out in the building. Um, and I think y'all have hinted at it maybe a few times, but could y'all talk a little bit more about why you chose to address MLK in this way and not uh, government? Uh, I, think it's, I think we address both in a way, and I'm gonna, here we're gonna go speed. Woo! I wish we had the model. <laughs> uh, yeah, if we had the model. I think we're, we're trying to address both, just in different ways. Uh, and let's go to the end, because the renderings are the easiest to sort of explain. This one. Oh, yeah. Oops. Ah! Ah! <laughs> You're seeing stuff that's not meant to be seen. That's good. That's always good. So <laughs> the way we've tried to address government is that, you know, it's more, a little bit more opaque here, that we have this sort of element of the roof deck, but this is all sort of floor to ceiling glass looking down into the specialty fabrication shop. So when you're walking along there at the, at the street level, you know, you have the ability, you're almost looking down into the 3D labs, the um, wood shop especially, which needs daylight, and then the metal shop is sort of at the end. You know, I, it's like, it's hard because we don't have all, I can't, I can't immediately just go to the plans, but there was a lot of thought in, at the street level making that a nice experience. So the idea here is that you know, we would have these, we, we set the building back um, from the line of these buildings a little bit to allow us to have a, um, like a sponge landscape, stormwater planner in front of the building underneath this big sort of, you see the steps that go up here in the porch. We've also set it back on this side so we actually have planting. Um, and so that water system actually works you know, around the entire building, just for the runoff from the building itself, not necessarily for the major runoff. I don't know if that answers your question. Hi, my name's Charles, I'm a faculty member here, and I, I wanted to follow up on Daniel's question because I noticed um, when Susanna was presenting the sponges that she called the service alley the front of the building, um, which I thought was kind of profound, and uh, you guys have always shown this building really from the inner quad and from what I had kind of assumed was the back. Yeah, this view. Um, and I saw in the work that you have done that it seems like in Portland too you have an experience with these kind of four-sided buildings. This yeah. isn't an infill condition. It's also, there's not a lot of context here. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering just if you could talk about how this building creates a place in a suburban area. Yeah, I think, um, it's interesting you say that because we really like, I really like buildings that look almost like different buildings from different um, facades, but they all sort of hang together. Um, there's elements where you see elements of the building from different sides. So it has a very different character from this side. So I don't really see there is a front of or a back to this building, really. To me, the excitement of, you could say the front is that, <laughs> you know, you could say the front is the porch, because that's probably how more, most people, you could say the front is, you know, that, you know, so, there, but there are different fronts doing different things. One is more of, you know, this is kind of the front you see from your car, you know, and, and you know, we were out here at night, there was just like, we could barely cross the street, there were so many cars going by. And then there's the Walmart parking lot right across the street. So we thought, you know, this, this building should have an urban presence on this side. But that's more about that presence and visibility, what you see from your car. But it still has the ability to be a porch and an entry. Um, I think the thing we're probably most proud about, at least in our kind of office, is that we were able to get kind of an informal entry at the corner here. And, and then have stairs that come up to a porch that goes in a deck, and then have two doors here and here that then go into what is really the lobby that's sort of at the level of this. There's a lot of issues with landscape here that we've tried to sort of tackle. 
I don't know if that, does that answer your question, Susanna, do yeah, you have I anything? Think, I mean, I think on, the, on this level, we created a much more kind of formal landscape at that, um, at that upper plaza, and that you sort of enter there, and that can give you access to the building at that upper level, and then you can kind of cascade down, down the hill. So there is a level of formality. You know, we didn't really do a, yeah, you can a rendering see, of that particular spot. You can um, kind of see it here. This but, is like a 1 to 20 um, ramp that sort of goes up for handicap access along that side. So that was sort of like a little sort of adventure, and then the stairs kind of come down here, and that's, the, that's probably the entry most people will use right into the cafe area, that's my guess, or they'll come from, and then the other entries are sort of more, in a way, ceremonial. And, but I think, you know, to answer your question about this idea of um, maybe in 50 years, there'll be more buildings on the other side of the street and that corner, it'll be a different equation. You know, you almost, you don't really want buildings to have a back, because who knows, the back might become the front, you know, down the road. I can. Oh, it's working. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I just wanted to add to that that when you're thinking about um, building something new in an area where there's not as much context to respond to, one of the things that's really important is holding a really strong corner. It's it's a way of placemaking, and it allows people to have arrived somewhere. They'll recognize that even though this is a ways away from campus that this building actually is campus now, right? So you'll see it and you'll be like, oh yes, that's the arts and design district. And it's a new campus for you, but it's really powerful that it's on this corner and that so many people are gonna be driving by every day and so many people are gonna be visiting the stores in the area. Even though it's not responding directly to something else that's across from it, it's making this place for you that you're gonna build on further when the rest of the campus is developed. I, I have a fun. Straight in the back. Well, I have a fun homework assignment for you. So, if we have 26 trucks um, coming with all the lumber, and it, it takes 10 hours each way, um, I want you to calculate how much carbon that is, and then tell me how many trees to plant in the arboretum. Uh, <laughs> nice. Um, this may be like also kind of a follow-up on the discussion that you've already been having about you know the directionality the approach to the building and this may be slightly a question for you guys but just more generally I am not sure if there's more proposed parking obviously there's gonna be bus buses and things like that how are people arriving or how are you thinking about people arriving to the building and um, do you want to answer that, yeah. Peter? Yeah. 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 In, and in fact, um, there, the parking that's there now yeah. is the parking that is proposed. Uh, the university is not planning to devote more of this site to more parking. In fact, the university is uh, increasingly proposing to be a bicycle, pedestrian, more walkable community and to emphasize the bus stop this is also, of course, of um, real, more immediate value, even to the School of Art, um, as a point of access, and then, of course, the Greenway Trail as a way of moving around. You know. I mean, we, we thought this is a great place to park bikes, <laughs> you know, in a way, covered, you know, and become sort of a, a central focus. I, it was fun. I actually went to the art school late at night, and there were, like, mopeds and bikes, and they were all parked in this sort of covered porch area that was actually, that was kind of a little bit the inspiration for these porches, but just taking, you know, that idea of these, uh, it was really interesting to see these sort of uh, covered outdoor spaces that are in a way kind of um, uh, protected and maybe in a way had areas that were fenced off. So, I mean, I think having these alternative modes for transportation, I can imagine this being a great scooter charging station, you know, <laughs> um, and that people will be using those as well. Thomas, what, I don't know if this will be a last question, but one question that I would have is um, much of what you've shown has a, a degree of robustness to it. The, there's a very evident structure that sort of scales down to a certain thickness. Uh, there's the um, facade system still has a, a certain thickness and, and dimension to it. What would you propose as the 
in a way, the smallest scale at which you're working, the one that's, um, let's say, at the scale of the hand. Uh, as much as anything can be touched along here, is there a, a detail uh, that you would even be able to identify within what, you, what you've done? Yeah, I leave it to Peter to ask a hard question. <laughs> but I think, I think for us, the, uh, you know, in terms of the scale, I don't really see, I see it sort of based on our capacity to do something of value. You know, if, if for instance, like, uh, is there a way to do some type of furniture that's a collaboration with the local maker that's somehow meaningful, you know? Uh, I think that's sort of the scale that we would want to go to. I mean, it might be, um, like, I, you know, we were doing research on, you know, Gibson baskets, you know, that the scale of, uh, of you know, a storage container for the shop could be made out of these materials, you know? I, I, think, I think for us, where we can add value is where we're connecting people that are, in a way, more talented at craft than us to make something new and reimagine what they already sort of know how to do. Um, that's kind of where I see us adding value. We can't do everything, and we don't want to do everything. We think uh, there needs to be spaces for other people to kind of finish things. Um, like, I mean, even I think if we were like talking with our director of interiors, Cecily, about like, well, could we do research on um, and support uh, furniture that's using, um, you know, wood fiber in really interesting ways, you know, whether it's combining with plastic or other things, and just thinking of ways to sort of set up an ethic about all the choices for um, the things in the building. So that's just sort of, hopefully that answers the question. I mean, I, I mean I'm kind of, I would get down to doing everything, but then I, then I wouldn't have a life. <laughs> and, and here too, I, I'm not really suggesting there's an absence. There was, I think, a very uh, a valuable uh, set of images you showed, which is uh, suggestions for the ceiling of the auditorium, yeah. for the uh, patterned uh, end grain uh, oak floor underfoot. Uh, yes, right. So I think it's it's there I, in a way. Yeah. I just wanted to highlight that amidst all of the other d discussion and you know, really sensible, valuable discussion about the rationality of structure and the fabrication system and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I, oh, go ahead, Chandra, talk about uh, the... Yeah, I was just going to say um, that that work there is so important because the building volumes are really defined by the structure. And you, what you didn't see in there was sort of layers of finished materials, right? So this is really calling out all of those special spaces that are really being highlighted. The auditorium, the residence, any of those public spaces would have this additional level of detail that is... Uh, you know, scaled down from what the rest of the structure is because the building is so grand on the interior that you really do need that finer scale of detail. And so this is sort of the beginning of that exploration to see what's really related back to this region and what kind of making happens here now that we would apply to really give this more, more meaning for everyone who's in the space. I mean, one, one thing about the Nature Conservancy, um, what one of the presidents said is like, you know, I want to be able to walk around the Nature Conservancy building and explain who we are and what our values are. And I would hope that with this building, somebody could give their friend a tour and say, this is from that, and this is from that, uh, and this is why we did that. And it wouldn't be uh, very complicated to be able to do that. Um, so that's, you know, we were thinking about that narrative, that person actually, maybe it's you, Peter. <laughs> That is often the role I have, I have to tell you, but <laughs> Carl. I have to say, I've, you know, I've been sitting through all of these, and you're the first firm that um, even mentioned a director of interiors, and so I just want to commend you on that, and how would you see the director, Cecily, uh, integrated into this project? I mean, she sits, like, right next to me. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not, there's not a sense of her not being integrated, you know, I think, I think, you know, for us, we, we tend to do sometimes very structurally driven buildings. So sometimes the interiors needs to play a really sort of strong wall in making them kind of feel human and comfortable and have color. I mean, if you're, 
you know, sometimes there's enough wood, right? You know, <laughs> you need some color. You know what I mean? You need you need a break, right? You know, and I think that I, I don't mean that in a in a condescending way at all. I mean that it's important, uh, and we know what we can do, and we know what Cecily and, and Kelsey can do, um, and you know, they're really they were really some of the they they you know they put together this slide. Uh, so they're involved, you know, and I think that that's really important. And Kelsey and I have uh, worked on, you know, we've been to working together for, I don't know, eight, nine years. So it's, it's an important part of firm. I, I mean, we don't, the interiors for us, when we do interiors, this is the kind of project we want to do the interiors for. On some of the really big office buildings, we team with a, a, a you know, an interior firm because there's just so much that we can't take it all on. If it's like a 500, you know, it's a 200, 300,000 square foot office building, um, we want to team with somebody. But when it's this sort of bespoke project, that's where we want to work, you know, really intently on that. And you know, the Nature Conservancy, you can look on our website. And now the Meyer Memorial Trust, we're doing all the interiors for those buildings, you know, in concert with the design. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, we're right at 7.30, maybe a little bit beyond. Um, I'll uh, refer everyone back to your previous uh, response, which had to do with a building that uh, anyone, student or faculty or staff, can walk through and discern its values and describe them to others as a, maybe a worthy, um, open-ended proposition for us. I want to thank you on behalf of the school and the university and uh, for your work, all the people that stand with you uh, in all of this, and please send our appreciation, take our appreciation back to them all. Um, we'll have the proposal now to continue to examine, and we wish you well on your travels home. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.